Thank you, guys. Giles, welcome back to Face, my trading warrior brother. How are hey, you? Hey, Dale. It's great to be here. Really looking forward to the session. How are you doing? I, I'm doing okay, and I'm uh, I'm also looking forward to what you brought to the table today. It gave me a few hints. So yeah, uh, if you hey, want to just uh, Dale, share your screen, Dale, Dale. I'm sorry. Before I duck out, I just want to say hello to Giles. Giles, I miss doing interviews with you, but it's good to see you here. Yeah, hi, Blake. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. I missed them too. So yeah, but good to catch up briefly here. Yeah, I'll I'll let you guys do your thing. So good to see you, and um, you guys have a fun one. Yeah, thank you, you guys are making me shut a tear. I'm going to play the violin. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Blake and Giles love each other, and there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, I love you so, too, Dale. It's, oh, uh, yeah, gosh. You know what uh, I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's great to be loved. Anyway, yeah, uh, exactly. better than the other, Giles. So I know you're talking about seasonals and gold and, you know, that uh, – you know, was really kind of surprising how it held 1680 without cleaning out the stops at the bottom there. Yeah. Because there were prior lows. And, um, but yeah. Um, yeah. Very nice rally. Um, is it getting stretched here? Uh, would you not reach for it here and wait for some type of pullback? Okay. So I'll, I'll give you a brief where I'm at with it, Dale. I was long silver immediately out of the FOMC decision. Um, okay. I was chatting with CNBC Arabia and I was saying to them and to another organization, the thing I wanted to see the Fed acknowledge was any acknowledgement of slowing growth was going yeah. to be enough in my book for the Fed to say to the market, we're not going to be hiking inflation in a pig headed way that's going yeah. to ignore slowing growth. So when you got it. Yeah. So when you consider, you know, and of course, you know, I'm not teaching grandma to suck eggs here. But when you consider how stretched the dollar was heading in to the last Fed meeting, and I was continually expecting the dollar to reach peak hawkishness. So I expected it back here in June, and it just kept going and going and going. So I've been expecting peak hawkishness alongside with you know, a lot of investors for quite some time. So yes. the final catalyst was the Fed acknowledging slowing growth. Now, well, you know what, Giles, I want to ask you something because yeah. uh, Luke Roman brought it up. You know, uh, the Fed meeting was after the first leg of the decline. And uh, yeah. he said that there was a very quiet G20 meeting okay. prior to that. And the euro stopped going down, went up every day since then. And also that was uh, right around the time of the yen high as well. Yeah. Do you think central bankers got together and cut some kind of deal here? And they're not announcing uh, intervention. Of course. of course, when you consider like 10 year yields kept rising and rising and rising. Remember, we had all those headlines about concern about the Bank of Japan. They yeah. kept saying they were getting freaked out, essentially, right. but not doing anything. Right. Yeah. So without a shadow of a doubt, if I was in their shoes and I was organizing uh, finances for a whole nation, would I be I have a hotline to all the other central bankers? Without a shadow of a doubt, Dale. Um, okay. So anyway, think, that you know, and it wasn't well publicized. That's another point yeah, he well, made. Well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to publicize it, would you? Um, but no, not like long, say come out and like the Plaza Accord type no. of thing where it's announced. So it's not like it's not like I have a conspiratorial view. I don't think there's a, some great conspiracy. I think it's just common sense, isn't it? You're trying to manage huge. Um, you know, countries' GDPs, uh, you would right. be doing something coordinated. And we see it anyway. I mean, look yeah. what the Fed's already done. And then it wasn't a massive surprise that the RBA has moved to a meeting by meeting basis now as well. And yeah. I'm expecting the Bank of England, oh, to move to a more meeting by meeting basis and probably bring forward recession um, projections into the end of 2022. That's what I would expect. Okay. So you, BOE was, uh, what did they talk about going a whole point or less? I think, um, let me just check what stir markets are with them. I think they're 50 basis points. Let me have a quick look. Uh, they 50. are, yeah, 50 basis points. So 92% okay. chance of a 50 basis point rate hike is um, in the stir markets. 
100% chance for 25 basis points. So that would be a disappointment, 25 basis points. But I'm not really looking at the interest rates right now, Dale, because I'm looking at yeah. the projections about growth because everyone's having to deal with surging inflation. So whether, you know, I, I was saying before the last Fed meeting, you know, I'm not, it's not really relevant whether the Fed hiked by 75 basis points or 100 basis points. What's relevant is what they're thinking about growth. So that's why we saw the dollar sink and then with gold, you see, this is what I saw, Dale, was the fall okay. in real yields. Yeah. Now, I use tips as a proxy for real yields because it's updated throughout the US session, whereas real yields is only updated once a day. So this is a bit more responsive, but essentially this tracks real yields. Uh, and for those okay. of your viewers who aren't aware, real, real yields is just a nominal bond yield minus inflation expectations. So what this tells us is 10 years have been dropping, yes. yields have been dropping, but inflation is still relatively high. So this was that stagflationary environment that gold bulls have been going on about. I got so many messages at Dale from gold buyers saying, you know, why is gold going down? Why is gold going down? Um, and I was saying, it's just because the dollar and real yields are going up. But That's when right. you get the dollar and real yields going down, that will be the catalyst that gold needs. And, you know, I just find it such a simple way to trade gold. You can see it back here in 2020 when you had real yeah. yields and the dollar moving lower. Look how gold outperformed yeah. april 2021 look how gold outperformed so you know and the converse is true as well when you have real yields and the dollar rising you see gold falling right so for there's me a, i just use it as a there, there's less opportunity costs when that's happening no less competition yes. Yes. yes yeah and also you have conviction to hold the position longer which goes back to me and answering your first question which is why I'm a bit more confident in holding gold um, longs and silver longs. Now, okay. silver was really interesting. Now, oh, that gold-silver ratio collapsed. Uh, now, this is what I saw, and it was just providentially, just the day before the decision, I was, I, I was running with some clients, and they just said to me, if, if gold's going up, because I was planning to go long gold on slowing U.S. growth, um, they said, will silver track gold? I said, yeah, silver will track gold, and just out of instinct, instinct i track track the ratio and lo and yeah. behold the ratio was moving 50 percent halfway back yeah and so for, for your list if your re listeners who aren't sh aware of this essentially when the gold silver ratio is high it tells you that silver is comparatively cheap to gold yeah. and a lot of traders will trade the ratio so when the gold silver ratio is very high like um we saw it recently. Yeah, we saw it in yeah, 2020. 125. It was all, yeah. And you remember that. I, was, I went long yeah. silver and I got long silver a car, around this kind of region. And I took profit way too early on that um, weekly resistance. That, this is the uh, silver chart in the, in the purple. So I took profit way too soon there, Dale. Right? Yes. And, I, and I missed out all that move. Um, so that's like, you know, m that's my loss, but I'm trying to learn from that this time. Um, so I'm expecting more, more bang for my buck in silver. And I went long silver immediately after the FOMC meeting. So I'm long in from whenever that was, you know, right down at these bottoms, I've got this trend line, which is lovely support now for me. So I feel very confident long and technically, um, it's one of the best, hammer reversal bars that I've seen in the monthly chart in silver for the last uh, yeah. at least 10, 10 years. Yeah, that is a big candle. That's a very large candle. And for those of you know, who need a little bit of help technically, it's got a long tail, it's got a bullish close. Now, crucially, and some folks make a mistake with this, Dale, when they're looking at a hammer reversal candle, is the candle has closed within the body of the previous day candle, which makes it more bullish. So if you see this candle here, yes, it's bearish, but you see the body is not within the body of the previous candle. So from a purely technical position, it's not as powerful as say this candle was here and this candle here. So that- And you got um, all the longs out on that flush. Yeah, it's, yeah. About 20, 40 and, you know. Do you know what I mean? But, you know, that was right around 61.8 of that uh, COVID rally. The lows. So people don't tell me fibs don't matter. Yeah, like they, yeah, they really, really matter. And, um, you know, people are looking at these technical levels. And obviously, 
I don't just trade technically, and I know you know that, Dale. I'm always combining the technicals and the fundamentals together. Uh, and that gives you that best conviction. So you look at this and you can see, okay, this is looking like a nice run up to 22 minimum. Even yeah. just technically, you'd expect a run up to 22. So any retracement's lower, but you've got this large moving average here as well. So yeah. we've got a major moving average, the 100 or 200 um, is being rejected. You've got this horizontal resistance level now forming support hammer reversal bar, you've got real yields dropping lower, dollar dropping lower, you've got the ratio quite high, the gold-silver ratio. So what's not to like about a long and silver? There's, it's still technically and fundamentally sound for a run up to 22. I'm curious, uh, Giles, yeah. if there is a pullback, where would be a retest of that channel line it broke out of? Yeah, that would, right. So that would be now... I'll just 19? Yeah, it's around 19. That's so okay. about 19. You know where you you know where you looking to go long gold and silver at the start of the webinar, um, Dale. Yeah, it was basically exactly that level because I remember thinking, yes, yeah, that's exactly where I'd go long silver and gold. So it's around this. It would be a retest here. And in fact, what I do is I probably put a fib on, and what I want to see is maybe the 61 might um, provide support. So okay. Uh, um, the 38 to... rather so you might get a bit of support at that 70 region so okay. i wouldn't be like stubborn and insist yeah. on a retest down here i you know i would be good advice trigger finger around that because it's also that large uh, support level okay um, yeah i feel more I... Uh, more uncomfortable short term that i let go of some of my long positions yesterday i don't i don't and... blame you Dale. as you said you know you've booked your profit you traded a strong um, fundamental move. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. And remember, maybe maybe I'm in the wrong because I'm remembering back to the gold silver ratio being high, and when I I took profit, you know, far too early when I could have had three or four times my run. Yeah, we're going to forty. That that's the uh, mean. I think that's where we're going. That's where my my take profit. I'm looking at taking profit just underneath twenty eight. I meant the gold silver ratio. Yeah, got you. It's going yeah. to 40. Yeah, yeah. If you have like, you know, 61.8% of that first decline. But uh, yeah, so you're, you're, yeah. you're bullish in metals. Uh, it, it brings me to this. Yeah. And you're in Australia, right, Charles? Uh, I'm in the UK. Oh, you're in the UK. Okay. Uh, your take on uh, the military buildup in the Taiwan Straits? Yeah, I was looking at that earlier. Um, a couple of things to say. First of all, if anyone wants a bit of help in geopolitics this book i recommend by tim marshall prisoners of geography it will really help you see where china views itself in the world and how it's going to relate to the us and its trigger points and taiwan is one of those trigger points yeah i was looking at it and i agree with most of the rhetoric that we've already had during the meeting that it's largely political uh, theater political theatre, but I also agree with um, the fact that it's political theatre with high stakes. And China, you know, you've got to run, look back, last sort of 10, 20 years, China didn't have any aircraft carriers. That They've now got quite a presence. And they'll be wanting to let the US and the world know that its military might is increasing. So this is a opportunity for China to get a couple of their aircraft carriers on the cameras, have a few jets circling around, um, just remind the world that they're there. And also, from a geopolitical perspective, remember China's just seen Russia move into Ukraine and NATO fold its hands to some extent. So... The first thing that I thought, well, that does potentially set a precedent, doesn't it? China might be thinking, actually, you know, what's the West going to do if we move into Taiwan? Terrible. So there is that element of doubt alongside the overall view I've got, which is that it's theatre. But for China, they have a genuine interest in bringing Taiwan back to Chinese territory. So it's not a theater that doesn't have real world bite. And there is one other difference. There is a um, military cooperation treaty with Taiwan and the US 
that did not exist with Ukraine. Yeah, well, that that changes it completely. So why on earth would China initiate aggression with the U.S.? It just wouldn't make any sense. Um, well, I mean, the people that think it may happen is because uh, for Xi to show strength in yeah. light of uh, the zero COVID policy and the, yeah. the economy suffering, yeah. the real estate market cratering, yes. rural banks, people can't get their money out of the banks. Yes. Um, so there are some things yeah. coming up, plus it's re, you know, re-election uh, in three months. He, he and and face is important, up. saving face. Yeah. Yeah, without a, a shadow of a doubt, uh, Dale. He'll but be, I hope all the skeptics are right. Yeah, the, pro the problem is, and this is the difficulty, is you always seem more intelligent when you're skeptical. So skepticism necessarily uh, portrays that you have some knowledge that someone else doesn't have. So you have to be aware of people who are permanently skeptical because it's, yes. it's, it's kind of a, um, a strategy for just making yourself, you know, something that you know that someone else doesn't, you know, so yeah. you can be constantly enigmatic and seem like you have a higher uh, level of understanding. Um, and, and that's nothing to do with our conversation from anyone here today. I just, I'm just speaking more generally. Okay. Um, so I know I led you away from your, your main topic, Giles. So, no, uh, that's fine, but that's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking. Of, that's what I'm thinking about. So just keeping an eye on it, but yeah. I'm not expecting it to do anything. And also I've written a few pieces on what to do when geopolitics goes wrong. The general playbook is to fade it, is to buy the dips. Yeah, you're prolific uh, putting out research, Giles. Yeah, thank you, Dale. Really, really. Work really hard on it. So I've got quite a few pieces on the geopolitical uh, playbook. Yeah. So everyone uh, at the minimum, you got to follow Giles on Twitter and pay attention to what he's doing. So, um, okay. Yeah, we could go there. Yeah, that was my... So um, this is where you find it. Yeah, you just find it here, blog.hycmlab. And all my stuff, I update there. 90% um, of my stuff gets updated here, Dale. Okay. All right. So for your intelligence gathering, instead of waiting every three, four months to hear him here, stay in touch, stay close, and uh, it's got a great uh, global view that ties in with the markets. Um, oh, anything else you want to want to cover here? Uh, you know, uh, s and uh, you know, uh, back in June, uh, we identified 41, 4200 as a battle zone for, yeah. um, you know, where uh, bears may want to take a stand. Uh, do you have a view on that? And yeah, I was in listening to the discussion earlier. Where's the SM? You know, where where are stocks going to be at the end of the year? And there's there's yeah. two thoughts I have. Is is one is I don't mind being wrong on where stocks are going, but I'm going to be data driven like the Fed because I think we've got a good opportunity now, especially for FX. Central banks are going to follow the Fed. They're going to be data dependent, and so we're certainly going to see markets move in line with data. So I'll be trading stocks in line with data. So if growth starts slowing, I'll just expect another leg lower. So okay. if we see more signs of slowing growth, we've got the ISM services PMI on tomorrow. Yeah. We've got NFP on Friday. Uh, we've got core inflation coming next week. So those- Yeah, a lot, they, lot on you know, the docket. Yeah, so there's a lot on the docket. So this is good opportunities for quick, nimble intraday trading. Okay, now, tactical stuff. Yeah, that's it. Ta like tactical, and that's the that's the time when us discretionary traders, this should be our bread and butter time because we're looking for when we see those short, sharp narrative changes, like the FOMC on Thursday last week, right? And that's when we make yeah. this is when we make our bread and butter. So this is the time not to be married to a view because, who, you know, who, in one sense, who cares whether you're right or wrong about something that's going to happen six, 12 months down the line? It's just like rolling a dice, really. As soon as you get past six months, you know, who knows? What's it's going like to a trading places bet between the Duke brothers. Yeah, it's just like, who, well, who knows? Yeah, you're going to make money on that, Ed? <laughs> yeah. If you're right about it? I don't know. You know, who and who cares? You know what I mean? So Yeah, I do know. Yeah, so that's. <laughs> That's what I think. And but what I would say is check this out. Um, look at the 
the moves in stocks around, let's just see. The FTSE has been one of the strongest uh, bourses out there, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. It, it has. I'm just trying to get the right. I'm just wanting to see one index. Let me see. Now, hang on. Let me get this right. I'm having a, let's look at the Dow. Does, it doesn't really matter which one. I just want to find one. Rep, that's it. I just want to find one index. Now, if you look over the last sort of 125 years, what you see is that stocks around 31st of October, and this is true across all the major indices, they tend to gain from the end of October into the end of the year. So okay. I will be looking at this time, and if there's any reason to go long in the Dow, the NASDAQ, the S&P 500, the DAX, the Euro stocks, okay. the FTSE 100, if any of them, I would be thinking, oh, that'd be a good run into the end of the year. So my um, ideal scenario, and I say this with respect because I'm, I'm not wanting bad things to happen, but what I'd expect is another leg lower in stocks as we see slowing growth build, and then a kind of capitulation around the end of October and the potentially gain into the end of the year. Okay, So Great that's seasonality. The, yeah, that's there. The season, using the seasonality because... You tend to see inflows into major equity indices uh, around this time, October, November, December. And, mm -hmm. and that's why, you know, people are away on holiday, trading buddies, you know, they're all over the place. Do you know what I mean? They're on holiday, right? They're not yeah. wanting to initiate big positions. It's just a bit of common sense here. So, And your seasonality high looks like it's coming in here. Is that at the beginning of September? Is that still in August? If you go back to the left before the low up here. Yeah, up there. Yeah, up there. So the low comes some. No, the high, the high. The high, the high is just here. No, no, no. Here. Uh, back in April. Yeah, there. September. Yeah. Okay, so that's almost, uh, you know, the fall. Yeah. So and I was saying that the rally could last in uh, until the uh, fall. Yes. So okay. Yeah. So I'm just I I don't use it in a mechanical mechanical way way Dale. Yeah. But like there was like this old school hedge fund guy who I've been in touch with over the last five, 10 years. Um, he, his pattern matches these seasonal patterns. And I've just seen him over the last five years. Like he pointed out to me when the gold silver ratio was high back in 2020, he pointed it out to me and said that his fund is going structurally long silver. You know, you don't want to miss yeah. out on this. Yeah. And then he, he does things like he sold all his stocks around April of this year Okay. I said, I'm not going to be doing anything now until like October, November. Wow. Do you know what I mean? So I thought I've yeah. kind of seen this from this guy. And he's those he's old like, school guys. Uh, they know a little bit. Don't yeah. They? He's like an old school guy. Do you know what I mean? He's, he's retired. Yeah. He's not looking, getting into the game, but he just loves yeah. the markets. He right? just has insights and wisdom and experience that you can't uh, really teach. You have to live through. You, to get. Yeah, you have to live through them. And I think like I would speak to, some people just wouldn't didn't recognize it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I was like, why yeah. are people not paying attention <laughs> to this guy with years of experience who's speaking yeah. such sense? You know what I mean? People yeah. were arguing with him. I thought, and that's how I got to know him a bit better. And I was like, actually, yeah. this, this is a this is a serious guy. He really knows what he's talking. So ever yeah. since that, I've just kept that in the back of my mind. Um, the one thing have I got have I got time to share one thing? Sure. And, and this is just to help like folks who may be struggling with intraday sentiment trading yeah so like this was a very short trade that we took this morning after the rba meeting yeah so it was just very simple using pivot points when the reserve bank of australia i'll just go back to the decision you can see it here it was just simply you read the um i know time is short but you read the report Don't the worry. bottom line was that the RBA said they're not on a preset path. Lo and behold, they're following the Fed. They're yeah. concerned about um, growth. So we know that this is uh, dovish. It wasn't particularly uh, tricky, okay? Uh, so we said, okay, the go-to currency pair for trading RBA, RBNZ divergencies is the Aussie New Zealand dollar. And we were just looking for a quick flush down to the S3 pivot point. Nice. So it's just very simple. And uh, It's I so easy. It's, you know, it's easy. Well, in, in once the problem Sometimes. that I had, Dale, the problem I had is I wasn't quick enough when I first yeah. started. I was too slow. So I would have seen this probably like today 
and yeah. thought to myself, oh, okay, that's a really good trade. Yeah. Sold at the lows initially, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Price then retraces. Um, and then by this. So now point, you're just reacting instead of thinking about reacting. You're not, you're not th yeah. And then by yeah. the time you get to Asia session tomorrow, you've got a new sentiment driver because you've got, the, you, you've got uh, data coming out of New Zealand and then it's a different driver. So what I realized is that when I was trying to trade intraday initially, I was trying to trade intraday like a swing trader. Okay. Do you yeah. see what I mean? So I do. I, if I struggled with it, then I expect others struggled with it. Other people are struggling with it. And so once you got that sentiment, commit to it. Because what you'd find is the Aussie New Zealand would really struggle to like get above that daily pivot point or that R1 pivot point. Yeah. Because sellers are going to step in there, right? So right. in other words, you can really anchor your stops and you can have conviction. So even now, US- What's the time frame on this chart? Oh, that's just a one hour chart, but the time frame okay. doesn't matter. These are daily okay. pivot points. Okay. Um, so all, you know, if US traders take this back up to 1.1067, I would sell, but I wouldn't be greedy. I just look for a move back down to 1.1046. Yeah. And then say, okay, I've taken it. And then at the end of the day, I close my orders. I wouldn't try and hold this overnight or tomorrow because then it's a new sentiment. So sentiment usually lasts two to three sessions and basically two sessions by the end of the London and certainly by the end of US tonight, it, it's over. Do you know what I mean? And then it's a fresh sentiment driver. Arguably, this may be a little bit different with the RBA. You might get another run lower. But if you do, you could just expect into that daily support. So the max move that you could reasonably expect would be a run down to 1.0980 anyway. And then you've got a, a reset technically because of all these collection of lows. What a great conversation, Joe. Yeah, good, Dale. You know, really, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I don't know if you're paying attention to the chat, but uh, thank you for coming here and edifying the community. Uh, you were much enjoyed. And uh, I always appreciate your insights. And, you know, one of the things I'm grateful for to Twitter is because I met people like you on Twitter. Oh. And uh, likewise, you're, I met people like you're a great addition to the rotation, buddy. Oh, Dale, that's I always look forward to it because I know I do a lot of media stuff, but sometimes I'm speaking to people that don't really understand and know and love trading. And it's a bit frustrating sometimes. You understand? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> when I'm talking here, I'm talking amongst brothers, you know, uh, people who understand and I know that they will appreciate and give good questions. And it's a it's a it's a different experience. So it's a mutual um, experience for me, Dale, too. OK. And uh, people are asking for your handle. It's Giles Coughlin uh, at Giles at, Coughlin. Am I right? Yeah, it's at Giles Coughlin. Should I put it in the chat? Yeah, go ahead. Post it for them. At Giles Cochran CC A. I think that's I'll just check I got I just check I got that right. And that, yeah, there you got it. There it is at Giles Cochran CCA. That's it. Yeah, that's All right. It. So uh, a guy who can see clearly through his bifocals, Giles Coughlin. <laughs> find him on Twitter. Uh, he's he's uh, really uh, has the patience and demeanor. You're going to learn a lot from this guy. Thank you again, my training warrior brother, for being yeah, in the face today. Absolute pleasure, and I look forward to the next time, Dale. All right, Giles. Good hunting, buddy. Yeah, take care now. Bye. All right. Adios. Giles Coughlin, everybody. Uh, you're very welcome. Giles, thanks again from the whole uh, attendee audience. And you could join the team in about 14 minutes on the morning edge. I'll see everyone tomorrow. Good hunting. Remember the difference between pros and amateurs are pros and know how to lose. So you have money left to be right with. Adios. Hey, traders, this is Blake Morrow with Forex Analytics. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like these videos, share them, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you in the next video.